part of what this graph shows is that we are now in an even bigger bubble than we were in in 2008. Yeah, except this is the graph out of the book, right? This is the one out of the book. And you can see that we're about at a level of about 210, 210. Yeah. And then we've since updated it with another annual data point. And from 210, we're now over 220, almost 225. Wow. The biggest real estate bubble in history. This is it. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this video. I've got Alan Hibbard with me once again. Alan, how are you doing? I'm great, Mike. Thanks. How are you? Good. You know, recently I was at this real estate uh, uh, conference called The Collective, uh, a mastermind group. Very, very, uh, probably the best uh, conference that I've spoken at so far. I mean, it was a very high caliber group of people and uh, just uh, something very special. Uh, but anyway, they were real estate investors. And one of the things that I did was I uh, showed them a couple of charts on the real estate being in the biggest bubble. We are currently in the biggest real estate bubble in world history right now. Uh, pretty much, a, it, it's almost across the globe in the United States and China is deflating big time. So uh, you've, you've prepared some of the charts to show us once again the difference between the charts in the book when it was published and updating them to today. So, yeah, exactly. So there's a very basic chart that we can look at when we think about home prices. And of course, we know that the price of every asset tends to go up over, over time, but that's really because we're creating more currency. So if we simply divide the asset prices, nominal asset prices by the amount of currency growth, inflation, we should get the real value of something over time. And that's what I have um, here, the real the, home price index of real yeah, estate. Yeah, uh, Dr. Robert Schiller has recreated the CPI though, right? Going all the way back to 1880, I believe. Yes, exactly. So yeah. he's recreated, he, he's come up with a basket of, of home prices and he has a whole methodology a whole methodology for doing that using 10 cities, 20 cities and so forth. Yeah. So, so people can look that up if they're interested, but it's basically and, a proxy for home values across the United States. Yeah, this is the 20 city index, I believe that you're presenting. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. it is. So yeah, it's indexed to 100. Um, so going back at the beginning of the time series, we, we, we know that the real home price index is 100. And over time, we would expect that home prices adjusted for inflation should be about 100, a little bit above or below forever. Uh -huh. I mean, it really, it really shouldn't deviate too widely from that metric over time or else something is out of whack. And as you can see here, <laughs> this, this giant run up to the uh, 2008 financial crisis, which started with real estate, uh, yeah. is super, super out of whack. Right. You know, I want to um, say that I first started presenting this graph. It's in my very first video, uh, which was when I was speaking at the Silver Summit in 2004. And so it was on that run up to the, you know, this that first bump there peaks at, in 2007. And uh, so 2004 is uh, on the way up. And I was warning people then in this video that and speaking to an audience that we were entering a massive real estate bubble and that this was not going to end well. Yep, so, exactly. Yeah. And it didn't end well. <laughs> no, it didn't. Global financial crisis is what it caused. Exactly. And you could argue that it still hasn't ended. There, there may have been a, a temporary reprieve and, and certain certain metrics may have returned to quote unquote normal, but other metrics right. uh, have been out of whack the entire time. And part of what this graph shows is that we are now in an even bigger bubble than we were in in 2008. Yeah, except this is the graph out of the book, right? This is the one out of the book. And you can see that we're about at a level of about 210, 210. Yeah. And then we've since updated it with another annual data point. And from 210, we're now over 220, almost 225. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And the this is annual data. The biggest real estate bubble in history. This is it. And so people think that 2008 was bad. Uh, we have, uh, in 2008, the stock market was not o that overvalued. Uh, so now... We have the end of the bond bubble. We've got the the uh, stock markets are tremendously overvalued right now. 
Uh, and, you know, the stock markets back in 2000, in the year 2000, they were just horrifically overvalued and they crashed and then came back down close to fair value and went started going up into 2008, but they weren't anywhere where they are today. So we've got the greatest bond bubble already starting to deflate. The 30-year bond is down 53%. The greatest real estate bubble in history. And uh, the I, I believe, according, it depends on how you measure it. Uh, if you're measuring uh, PE ratios or uh, the Buffett indicator, uh, we're either the biggest stock market bubble or the second biggest stock market bubble uh, in history. And so with all of these bubbles, the next crisis is going to be much worse probably than 2008. So, uh, yeah, so keep on going. Uh, so basically, you know, what? one of the things I just want to let everybody know, uh, maybe that 100 line, uh, maybe Dr. Robert Schiller should have indexed that to the average throughout the uh, 50s and 60s and 70s, that area right in there. I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit low, but if we are up at 225%, that means real estate is overvalued by 125%. And when a correction happens, it that means that it could lose more than half. Real estate could lose more than half of its value during the next correction. And that is going to be devastating. And you'll see the Fed overreact. You know, we'll have zero interest rates again. We'll have uh, massive currency printing. But each time it, it gets harder for... You know, they're slapping Band-Aids on cancer. And uh, uh, and each time uh, it, it, they have to either create more currency or come up with more little gimmicks to try to uh, plaster over the cracks in the foundation of the economy. Yep, exactly. And to your point, even if real estate did lose half of its value over some period of time, if it starts at, let's call it 220, losing half of its value is still 110. So it still right. would be above average. Yeah. So so maybe maybe you could argue that there's a slight upward trend here if you know you imagine that people do home improvements and the cost of those improvements isn't really captured, right? The expenses are kind of outside of the data set and that they just would show up as asset appreciation. Maybe you could make that argument. Real estate's a little tricky to measure like that, but yeah. it certainly isn't going up exponentially. Like we know that even if there is a slight upward trend here, we're still right. above it by more than we ever have been. And once again, we, we need to remind everybody, this is inflation adjusted data. <laughs> it's it's already so, inflation yeah, adjusted. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So, so it, there, this there far ahead one. of all the inflation that we've had, it's just amazing. And once again, scary. Yeah. It is. Yeah. So there is one more chart I want to show you. This was not in the book, but it still pertains to um, the real estate bubble. Okay. Hey, guys, just want to let you know that we'll be running a Black Friday deal at goldsilver.com. If you want to turn some of your currency into real money, you'll get fantastic deals like 20 percent, 30 percent or even 55 percent off premiums on the products you already love. So go to goldsilver.com now. It still pertains to um, the real estate bubble. Okay. This is this is home price. This is a ratio of home price to median household income. So yeah. home price to median household income. So it basically measures affordability in a certain kind of uh -huh. way. Uh, and you can see that right. the housing it looks bubble, like people used to pay around four years of their income to buy a house. And now they're paying... Uh, seven and a third years of their income. So the housing bubble there the, the, that triggered the 2008 financial crisis, that looks like it's at about 6.8 times their income, right? And yep, now we're up, at, mm -hmm. yeah, we're up at seven and a third now. It, yep. This is uh, absolutely crazy. And it's just more supporting evidence to suggest that Do Dr. Robert Schiller's data is correct. The, the previous charts that you just showed uh, this is another way of measuring it. And this is the greatest real estate bubble in history. It's bigger than 2008. Uh, we have a different, uh, you know, different circumstances when it comes to the foundation. Uh, we don't have the same derivatives that we had back then. But we've got things like uh, commercial real estate being 50%. A lot of it is 50% empty. And on commercial real estate, 
uh, the, the bank values, and a lot of the commercial real estate has shorter term loans than 30 year mortgages, uh, and it rolls over and you have to refinance. But the bank values the property based on the occupancy, the cash flow that's coming in. It's not based off of the structure and the location. It's largely like there was a building uh, that was on Twitter recently that in 2019 had sold for 64 million and just sold last month for uh, 16 million. Um, yeah, 16 million. Right. And um, and that was because of the occupancy and then the owners not being able to refinance because you've either got to cough up a ton of cash or uh, you've got to, you know, the bank, if, if the riskier it gets, the higher the interest rate is going to be. So the higher the monthly payments are going to be. So if you don't have uh, high occupancy. So my point is that uh, we've got a real estate bubble, a stock market bubble, and a bond bubble all simultaneously. And with real estate, it's not just residential this time. It's residential and commercial. And that isn't the way it was in 2008. Commercial didn't implode. It was residential only. And so now we've got both of these. So this is, it's massive. And everybody needs to pay attention to this because you can see the future. I think 2024 is going to be a bad year for most people. Maybe it's 2025. I don't know. They seem to be really good at kicking the can down the road. But each time they kick that can, the more it's delayed, the more energy builds up and the greater the implosion. Exactly. And to your point, that's what we've been seeing with housing demand at all. Uh, you know, when you lower interest rates and you reduce the uh, qualifications for a mortgage, you pull a bunch of demand from the future and you get a whole bunch of people buying houses in the present who otherwise would have waited. And eventually that has to revert. As you talk about the energy has to go back to equilibrium. And just like a ton of people, you know, basically made a lot of sacrifices to get into homes. Uh, they're going to eventually be making a lot of sacrifices to get out of their homes, right? Yeah. Because they're going to have so much debt, so much liabilities on their personal balance sheets. People are going to say, get me out of this house. I can't afford the payments. I can't afford the interest. I can't afford the utilities. Just get me out of here. And they'll pay a massive cost to get out of those homes um, just to revert that balance of energy. And it's going to be really, really sad to see that. But it is inevitable, yeah. it seems. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, so, so there is something else I kind of wanted to shift gears, but stay on the same topic and talk about the 30 year fixed rate mortgage, really paint a picture with some specific numbers of just how um, housing affordability has changed in the last couple of years. So this here is the 30 year fixed rate mortgage average in the United States, and this is Federal Reserve data. And you can see just a couple of years ago, we had those historic low mortgage rates. People are getting mortgages yeah. at 2.7%, 2.8, 2.9. Plenty of people for plenty of months were below 3%. Right. And now with the recent uh, record, record high rate of interest rate hikes, we're all the way up to 7.5% on mortgages average in the United States um, as of November 9th. So uh, we went from below 3% to up to 7.5%. And so I want to show you, using a mortgage calculator, how that affects the monthly mortgage payment and some of the other numbers around equity uh, by pulling up two examples. So remember these numbers, 3% and 7.5%. Let's, let's see what a mortgage calculator would look like. So I have here a, a supposing a million-dollar home. Now, Maybe some people aren't going to afford a million dollar home, but it, it makes for round numbers. So that's why uh -huh. I chose that interest rate of 3% over 30 years, starting uh -huh. in January. And I, I zeroed everything out because this is, this is going to depend uh, wildly on, you know, what part of the country you're in and your personal circumstances and that kind yeah, of thing. So this is just the actual loan on the house, not <clears throat> property taxes and uh, home insurance and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. Okay. And I also assumed no down payment because, that also varies widely yeah. from zero to 20 percent. I mean, people have all different circumstances. So this. Yeah. This you is wanted to know what the million dollar. You, give me a I'm sorry. Create a million bucks that didn't <laughs> exist the second before my signature hit the loan document. Create a million bucks for me. How much is it going to cost me over two over 30 years? 
Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Promise me a million dollars of future economic growth. Um, and you can have it today. Anyways, so the mortgage payment is $4,200. $4,200. That's kind of our baseline as if we it had a 3% rate and as if you know, we bought a house just a couple years ago, let's yeah. say the middle of 2021. Okay, go back to the mortgage. Okay, one thing I want to point out, the int total interest that you're going to pay on the house for the million dollar loan is uh, just over $500,000. So you're, you're mm -hmm. paying about 50% uh, over the amount that you're borrowing. So, okay. Yep. yep. Okay. And now compare and, and $4,200 per month and you pay for the house one and a half times. Okay. Yeah. The oh, and then go to the amortization chart above. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I want to show people where is the area where you actually own 50% of your home? Where you own 50%. Okay. So that's when your yeah. outstanding balance would drop below $500,000. So um that's out here okay it looks like it's right here between 2041 and 2042 you would own half the home okay so that's about 17 years yeah okay so hang on yeah. so now let's compare because we have a lot of numbers so let's yeah. compare them so at let's go back to the, let's go back to the rate i don't <laughs> want people to be confused remember we <laughs> wanted to compare what would have happened at a three percent rate a couple years ago to a seven and a half percent rate today. Yeah. All right. So at seven and a half percent with no other numbers changing, still a million dollars, the monthly payment is just shy of seven thousand. Seven thousand wow. compared to forty two hundred. So yeah, in seven dollars and eighty five cents shy of <laughs> seven thousand. Right. Seven dollars and eighty five cents shy. Yeah, that's right. So it's basically seven thousand compared to forty two hundred. That is a massive increase in monthly right. payment if you decided to wait two years to buy a house uh -huh. um, and total interest, this is 1.5 million in interest compared to half a million in interest. So you're paying triple right. in interest instead paying of paying 150% instead of uh, 50%. Yeah. Instead of paying for yeah. the house one and a half times, you're going to pay for it two and a half times. You're going to pay yeah. an extra million dollars. You're going to pay an extra million dollars. Uh-huh. Wow. That's crazy. Right. Um, oh, and... you know, another thing, uh, look at how with the higher interest payment, you know, mortgage uh, is to engage in debt until you die. Mortgage, mortality. And so it's mortgage to engage in debt until, until death. And uh, so <clears throat> take a look at the what you're paying on for the first five years and how little of it goes to uh, actually buying the house. It's, it's all going to the bank's profit. It is all interest. And uh, and then it ramps up once you get, you know, the trajectory sort of changes at about the halfway point and you're paying more and more on the house. Now, most people buy a home and then five years later or six years or seven years, sell it and buy another one. And so they're always on this treadmill of paying just the interest. Now go back to the 3% loan for a second and look at how much is actually being paid toward the house instead of the bank's profit. Yeah, and, this is sizable. So let's let's actually yeah. quote some numbers here. So imagine you, you buy a house and then you live in it for between five and seven years. So let me go to 2029 and imagine selling it in 2029. And the question is how much equity do you have at that point if you only lived in the house about six years? So here you would have uh, about 136,000 in equity. 136,000 in equity. That's at, at the low interest rate. 136. So that's about 13 percent. Uh, yeah, 13.6 percent uh, equity. These are million dollar loans. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And here you have 68,000. So that's like that's half. That's less than half. That's six six point eight percent equity. So in compared uh -huh. to 13 percent, compared to six point eight percent. Yeah. Um, you, you have half the equity. So th th right. that's insane. That's, that's insane. It just, just waiting two years to buy a house at the much higher interest rate, your equity is going to yeah. get cut in half if you sell it when most people do about five to seven years after. Buying. Now I do want to say for everybody that's a real estate investor out there, if you've got cash flow, none of this stuff matters. If you've got cash flow and you're pretty certain that your rents are not going to fall in a real estate crisis or occupancy rates go up. Uh, none of this matters as long as you are 
making more income than your payments to the bank. That's all that matters. So, uh, okay. So uh, go ahead and take us through this a little bit more. Yeah. Um, well, I have one other hypothetical example here. I have a, th a third tab of, of the mortgage calculator. And basically the, the question here is, suppose, suppose that as, as an individual, you have a fixed salary, you have a job, and you can only afford the same monthly payment that you could have afforded two years ago. So two years ago at the lower rates, 3% rates, we said that for a million dollar home, the monthly payment is about $4,200. So suppose that's all you can afford today and you wanna buy a house today at the higher interest rate. It's seven and a half percent today, but you can only afford 4,200 a month. Now the question is, how much house can you buy? Can you afford right. that million dollar house? Of course not. After a little bit of guess and check, it turns out if you want to stay under $4,200, you can only afford a home that's about $600,000, 602000 602000 yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's a 40% decrease, right? That, yeah, it's about 40%. Exactly. So yeah. what that means effectively is that, you know, take, take away the real estate investors, just looking at people who buy a single family home and they live in it themselves and they have to, they have to earn income from a job in order to pay for their housing. Right. Instead of being able to afford a million dollar home two years ago, you can only afford six hundred thousand today. So your right. home affordability has dropped 40 percent in two yeah. years, 40 percent in two years. And this is this change that is happening right now is in the face of the greatest real estate bubble in history and with the overvaluations just at insane levels. And so anybody that doesn't think and, and along with that, the uh, the commercial real estate occupancy crisis, that is a crisis. And so these two things rolling over at the same time should cause another crisis. And then the stock market's in a bubble. What happens when there's a crisis in the economy? The stock market crashes. What, what is the Fed's response? Print, print and type. <laughs> Lots of zeros. Like, yeah, uh, and it, it's funny, I, and all this printing. When you think about the app, the, the basics, what does it mean to just print money and you know inject it here and currency? And, and, <laughs> oh, I've been so good about that. Yeah, currency. When you just create currency and send it here and there, and you have all these different programs, and what what does that really mean? It's creating promises that the the private sector will bail themselves out of it later. That's what it is. It's yeah. like I'm promising that eventually you'll get yourself out of this, but I'm just <laughs> going to push things around until right. you figure a way to get yourself out. That's what it is. Because they're buying assets that are all cash flow from future taxation or future mortgage payments. And so it's basically you bailing yourself out today uh, by promising to make the payments for the currency. The Federal, Federal Reserve is borrowing into existence today. You're going to make those payments in the future. It's, it's a totally insane system. Yes, it is. And so whenever they say like, oh, we have, you know, these banks are too big to fail. Oh, we have to bail out the financial sector. Like I'm thinking, no, we don't. We do not need to keep bailing this out and perpetuating the system. Like the longer it goes on, the worse it's going to be. Like we kind of right. want a new system. You know what I mean? Right. And, and they say, you know, they being the government, the Federal Reserve, whoever, uh, the powers that be that, Oh, we need to do this and we need to do that. We need to do this. But they never tell you that you're the one footing the bill. <laughs> oh, we'll exactly. fix it. We know what to do. We're experts. <laughs> exactly. Well, so. all we can do is uh, all we can do is try to get ourselves out of debt and uh, do our best every day. Yeah. I don't know. OK, uh, awesome uh, charts. Thank you very much for putting all of this together. And I want to thank everybody for watching this video. And please like subscribe. Uh, smash that uh, notification bell and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Mike. Hey guys, just want to let you know that we'll be running a Black Friday deal at goldsilver.com. If you want to turn some of your currency into real money, you'll get fantastic deals like 20%, 30%, or even 55% off premiums on the products you already love. So go to goldsilver.com now.